Thank you, Jesse. This is exciting. Um, so one thing, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a photo of the room to document the brave people who stay so long. <laughs> Please smile. Actually, it's a video. So, um, and then to those who were asking whether I will be tweeting during my talk, the answer is yes. So um, I'll be speaking about the role of biomarkers and when I was thinking about what I was going to speak about, I give many talks about biomarkers. Somebody said that I could give it really in my sleep if I ever went to sleep. But uh, I was thinking what could be really interesting. So I changed a little bit the talk and you'll see towards the end it's going to be a little bit more of a call for action. Um, this is my disclosures. I collaborate to many companies that try to find drugs to in IPF. Uh, most of it is not related to this talk. I do have patents on peripheral blood biomarkers in IPF, and since I'll be speaking about it, it's important you'll be aware. Um, so I'll speak a little bit about what we know, and especially on, on the amazing progress we did on mortality predict, uh, prediction, and a little bit of diagnosis, and then I'll actually speak about what we need to do to really have these biomarkers impact our life clinically. So what is a biomarker? A biomarker is basically uh, uh, a variable that is objectively measured and indicates normal or pathogenic process. So actually, if you measure your um, blood pressure, this is definitely a biomarker. Uh, and, oh, but in the context of this discussion, it will be more molecular biomarkers, things you can measure in your blood, in your uh, lungs, in your tissues. And there's multiple types of uh, biomarkers. There's predispositions, so like genetic markers, there's diagnostic uh, biomarkers, there's prognostic markers, mechanistic and treatment relevant. And in, in a sense, just to summarize, I can tell you that our biggest success in IPF is prognostic biomarkers. We actually have better prognostics biomarkers in IPF than many other diseases. The difference is we're shy, we don't use them. Uh, and biomarkers should be uh, simple, technically accurate, bo broadly reproducible, tested in multiple cores, standardized, have an accessible risk. So, of course, um, I don't know, exhaled breath is going to be better than blood, and blood is going to be better than uh, bronchovelo lavage, and bronchovelo lavage is going to be better than lung tissue. You want to have a biomarker that's easy to use, reproducible, and safe. And as I said before, our biggest success in the last few years has been prognostics. So I would like to mention one thing which is important, which is biomarkers have to be standardized. Uh, I stand on this podium and I'll tell you I have sinned because I've published in different papers the same biomarkers using different methods. Should not happen. And um, as a community and also as a principal investigator, I commit that we will not do this again. But this is the kind of things that the field would have been way better if we would have standardized earlier. Um, you want to, when you think about biomarkers, you want to start with actually reminding yourself what is IPF and basically this is sort of the uh, typical um, histological lesion of IPF with normal lung adjacent to remodel lungs with the myofibroblast foci. And what we would like to know is actually how this uh, beautiful uh, uh, area that's built for gas exchange becomes the sort of messy um, scar of tissue. And our model, and you've heard it, assesses recurring mitral injuries, epithelial cell injury, cellular activation, matrix deposition, genetic predisposition, and many other things. And when we think about biomarkers, and this is using a really nice diagram from uh, Brett Lay's uh, uh, paper a few years ago, is basically our biomarkers should reflect what is happening in the, uh, uh, in the tissue and in the lungs. So you have the epithelial barriers, the, uh, the cells are suffering, and there's things that could be secreted to the blood and things that go in to the, uh, um, to the alveolar. This. And I will, for the sake of sort of focus, I will focus mostly on circulating biomarkers. And I'm mentioning here, this is sort of, sorry, um, this is sort of a, a sh relatively good list, I think, of things that have been shown in the literature and have been relatively reproduced, usually more than one paper, not always perfect. Um, several of these have actually multiple uh, cohorts, and I'll mention, I'll speak later about MMP7, but definitely SPD 
um, surfactant D, CCL18, anti-HSP70, uh, CXCL13, VCOM, uh, LOXL2, the neo apotypes, free mitochondrial DNA, microRNAs, and more recently to be published in like a couple of weeks, uh, cancer markers. These are things that you find retro re reproducibly in the blood of patients with IPF. Our group was interested in a molecule called uh, MMP7. It's basically a small protease that basically degrades protein. It's people tend to think about this as more of a matrix remodeling uh, molecule in the context of IPF. That's not true. It is actually a marker of what happens to abnormal cells. It's a Wnt beta catenin pathway and reflects how the epithelial cells are suffering. It has multiple potential roles in regulating local inflammation, has a role in epithelial cancers. Knockout mice are relatively protected. It is highly expressed in epithelial cells in IPF. And it's the most validated outcome. Actually, if you look at it, it's probably the most studied biomarker in pulmonary fibrosis and uh, has been repeatedly uh, replicated. Um, we have sort of uh, st stumbled on uh, MMP7 many years ago when we did a targeted proteomic uh, appro uh, analysis of IPF lungs. And basically, Ivan Rosas has shown that uh, MMP7 is really high in, the, high in the blood of patients with IPF, much higher than in patients with sarcoidosis and COPD and other things. We've also shown that the origin is probably from epithelial cells in the lung, uh, and that's been uh, uh, validated multiple times. Uh, much later, we did another uh, proteomic, many, mini proteomic screen to try to identify whether there were markers of um, mortality in IPF, and to our surprise, uh, MMP7 showed up again as a marker of uh, 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 um, mortality. We replicated it in uh, an independent cohort at, at the time that we did it. This was with Kevin Gibson and uh, Tom Richards, 2012. So there were actually no, except from our studies, no other replicated studies that included both an uh, uh, derivation and replication cohort in pulmonary. I'm glad to say that now the situation is much better. And basically, the replication was perfect, and we could calculate this index. It doesn't really matter. That's published in which if the index is high, the patients are ha going to have an accelerated phase. If the index is low, they're actually relatively stable. And this is really important. When we, there's patients in the room, family members and others, when we, when a patient hears about the diagnosis of, of IPF, they Google it or they speak, the first thing they hear is the terrible um, median survival, right? Three to five years, that's a very unpleasant thing. What people tend to forget, that also this also means that 50% live longer than three or five years. So I think it's really important to actually identify who will have an accelerated phase, which they need one type of treatment, and patients who are relatively stable. And um, this is probably, if there is one finding in our hands, using molecular mark markers, that this is the most consistent two groups in IPF, stable and accelerated. Um, more recently, uh, we wanted to see if, and this is Argiris Soflekis, uh, who is now in Greece, wanted to see if MMP7, if you could use a threshold studied in, identified in one continent, could you use it to predict outcome in another continent? And what it did, it took actually the numbers from a paper by Dong Soon Kim from South Korea and took the threshold she chose to predict outcome in patients with IPF. And then he said, okay, let's see if this is predictive in Yale. And now I do genomics and biomarkers for a living. And I can tell you, I read a lot of literature. You usually don't find it. It's like, you know, in most molecular markers, they're highly specific. And it's quite surprising that actually using this uh, 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 threshold of 12.1 or whatever it is, basically you, could, you guys could see the, the difference. The patients with uh, lower levels of MMP7 were very stable, whereas the patients of uh, uh, high levels of MMP7 de deteriorated, and that's highly reproducible. So there's no doubt that this is reproducible. Um, MMP7 is also interesting because it could be an indicator of early disease. And again, Ivan Rosas in that initial paper that we did, he had a court of patients with uh, what we called then subclinical ILD, now we call them at risk, and basically you could see that these were controls, these were patients with familial or sporadic IPF, and the patients with subclinical ILD who already had 
uh, didn't have symptoms, but had some findings in their lungs, had higher levels of MMP7 in their blood. This has also been um, indirectly replicated, and you've heard actually, uh, um, Tim Blankwell presents the, the, the results of their data, which suggested the same thing, that patients with at risk had, had lower, higher levels of MMP7. Um, this is a, another paper by uh, um, Tracy Doyle from the Evans uh, group that showed that patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, interstitial lung disease, and you've heard about this, connective tissue ILD, the same thing, MMP7 is higher. And, uh, and sort of just to even make it slightly more impressive, I think this is the, David, the work for David Leather's group. Uh, Hilary Armstrong did this with, uh, uh, with Anna, and basically they showed that actually in this interesting phenomena, the patients with interstitial lung anomalies, that we think that at least in a subset, this is a marker of subsequent disease. Uh, one is high uh, MMP levels are associated with the presence of these interstitial lung anomalies. So if patients who have normal CT scans usually don't have higher levels of MMP7, and then more importantly is actually if patients had the interstitial lung anomaly and the higher levels of MMP7, the risk of their subsequent mortality was higher. We have to be careful about these things. We don't, this, was not, this is actually not a study designed prospectively to look at the effect of MMP7 or mortality. And I think in every one of the things we discuss, we show a lot of what I would call circumstantial evidence or appealing evidence. Uh, but uh, regardless whether it would be GERD in pulmonary fibrosis or actually TOLIP, uh, everybody will forgive me, he knows the thing, or oh, MMP7, we have not yet designed a prospective study that looks at the markers and their effect. The amazing thing, at least for Tolip and NAC, we will know the answer because the study is f amazingly well designed. Um, the other thing which I found very interesting, and this has to do with starting to connect with what could we do? How could we then study? So there's a new technology in which you use uh, precision cut human lung slices and try to study. People ask me many times, and usually it's drug companies, what is the best model for pulmonary fibrosis? Which animal should we use? A mouse, a rat, a ferret, whatever. And my answer, you know, sadly enough, our best model is the human. You know, if a drug improves the human, we know it works, right? If a drug improves the mouse, you know, the MD in my title is not mouse doctor. Uh, so, although if I would, could, could take care of cats, my daughters would be really happy. So, uh, basically, in this study, uh, 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 it was shown that basically you can create fibrosis. You can take precision cuts, you can take human lungs, normal human lungs taken for, um, rejected for uh, organ donation or other things. You could cut them and keep them in a way that keeps them viable. And then you could give them a, things that cause fibrosis. It's a, basically, they created this soup of markers, it doesn't really matter. And then they looked whether there was an increase in what we think are fibrosis markers. And this is sort of traditional thing, alpha smooth mass lactin, CTGF. But I thought it was very interesting that MMP7 and actually WINT was also increased. Now the cool thing that now that you have a sort of a human model of fibrosis, now you could start screening drugs. So what uh, Dr. Limper was saying about the need to screen, this is not gonna, never going to be high throughput. It's a little bit hard to do. But at least good targets, you will not check it in. And we are actually, um, we are doing precision cut slices actually in IPF tissue, so hopefully this will be very informative. Um, so just to summarize, MMP7 considerably increased in IPF and other LDs, multiple cohorts, increased in patients at risk with, with or, where, uh, uh, or with preclinical disease, predicts mortality, uh, most probably marker of epithelial changes. And the challenges, again, standardization, 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 within the same group, my group, Two different papers have different methods. So we have to make sure we do it. The mechanistic rule is unclear. The, the promise is, of course, it's very robust, cheap and easy, and it's been multiple times reproducible, and especially in combination with KL6 and SPD. Now, the other thing that we see when we look at the IPF, at patient with IPF, is actually we have a signal in 
cells in the blood. They are different. And one of the ways that my group chose to look at it is basically take blood from patients with IPF, take out the cells, and measure their RNA. And Jose Razzo in the lab basically many years ago basically took cells from patients with IPF, uh, analyzed all the genes in their genome, and came up with a signature of 52 genes uh, uh, um, uh, that was predictive of outcome. And basically, when you use these genes, again, if the patients had this pattern, they had, uh, if they had this pattern, they actually lived pretty long. But if they had this pattern, they died uh, faster. And this was done in collaboration with Imre Nath uh, and University of Chicago, and then uh, replicated in Pittsburgh. And we were very happy with it, especially because when we looked at the groups of patients and tried to see if there's any other difference between them, there's not. They look exactly the same. For the physician, they look the same. But based on their genes, they're different. And then uh, a few years later, um, um, we were able to, ac uh, uh, to ac accumulate six cohorts. So basically, this is probably in pulmonary medicine the biggest replication study. And what is amazing, and you can see this is a basically a heat map of the genes. And this is one cohort, two cohort, third, three cohorts. Cohort and uh, uh, I cannot okay I'll, I cannot see from here, but this was um, uh, Chicago, Yale, Pittsburgh, um, Imperial College. Uh, shout out if I'm forgetting anybody else, uh, Freiburg. And basically, what you see is that this is a heat map. So yellow is increased, purple is decreased. Every row is a gene, every column is a patient. How the pattern in all of the cohorts is similar, and these are the mortality plots, and they're similar. So basically, we have now a very impressive signature. And what is also impressive is, is this is a measurement of the prediction accuracy. So it's not enough that you predict something, but it has to be accurate. How many times you make a mistake, right? You want it to be accurate in like 70, 80 percent. You want it to be definitely better than a flip of a coin. So when we use clinical prediction alone, we were at around 65 percent prediction of outcome. But when we add the genomic profile, and especially early on, we can go over 80%, and then later to 70 so again, suggesting that this could be something that we could use. The other thing that people ask you, okay, so this is when patients get diagnosed, so how does this change? And I think this is a very important slide. So the score, the risk genomic scores, has two parameters, sort of a, a higher line and a lower line. This is the patients who are uh, high risk. These are the patients who are low risk. So blue is high risk, red is low risk. So as you see, you don't change. So if you're low risk, you actually stay most of the time low risk. What we see here that this sort of starts opening up and that's the patients who actually deteriorate. But if the high risk patients basically never go down, and why is this important? One, it does suggest that when patients present, they are on the different trajectory. Some of them are gonna be stable. Some. The other thing, now if we had a drug that moved you, this, imagine now this blue line moving here, then we could have an efficient biomarker and we could start planning shorter trials. So does this happen? We don't really know. But in our cohorts, out of around 90 patients that were treated, um, there was a small minority of patients that although they were high risk at the beginning, they sort of broke the line into the low risk. It's actually six of, out of 100. And when you look at these patients, and this is the force vital capacity, this is actually a big increase. This is the patients who don't change. They go down like everybody else for this. Now again, at six patients, it could be still a random statistical error. But again, if we do a thousand patient study, and we find 60 like this, we say, okay, these patients, they're really benefiting from whatever antifibrotic drug they're on, and it doesn't matter now. So just to uh, summarize the, the peripheral blood mononuclear cells uh, gene expression, we have a 52 gene signature that's highly reproducible. Uh, you know, there's actually a calculator online, uh, and it's really um, good. It does not change during disease progression, but we have some evidence that may change after treatment in patients that get better. Uh, what about the lung? And I, I'll summarize this. This is, this is a very strong uh, signal for uh, uh, survival in the lung. This is anti-process work. Uh, there's also 
uh, signals almost in everywhere we touch. So, but the blood is the most validated. So MMP7, SPD, KL6, the 52 genes, telomere rank, length of the, you've heard, these are like, these are robust things, you know. Um, they're probably <laughs> more reproducible than troponin, although people won't like me to say it. Uh, and um, we have some clue about diagnosis, but I won't go at it for time. What we don't have is nothing about disease bur burden and nothing about molecular hardware. So how do we come up? So one is if blood markers are so good, why don't we use them? So as many of you heard me, this is sort of a very famous diagram of innovation adoption life cycle. Basically, when something new comes out, you have the innovators, the people who latch on to this, the early adopters, the early majority, the late majority, and the laggards. And sadly, I will say that the pulmonary community has been laggards. And what we need to do is find some kind of an emotional way to sort of shift our, uh, 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 our approaches and move to early adopters. And uh, the other reason is actually a very simple one, lack of economical reason. Nobody will make money off of these biomarkers. So how do we address this? How do we implement biomarkers? So what I would say is the only way to implement biomarkers is implement them. So what we should do, and I'm glad to sort of hear that multiple people in the industry now and uh, Peter Schaefer's and others have won this, we should create a partnership between industry, academia, and patient advocacy to fund the generation standardization and performance of a basic IPF panel that would be part of the initial evaluation of every patient. So basically, if you're on the registry, you get your genetic data if you want. And this will, should include the most common variants, MAC5B, TOLIP, peripheral blood proteins, the 52 gene signatures, and telomere length. Not too much. And how does the patient affect this, right? Because I've, I can speak over the podium. We know it has a limited place. And I'm going to take, actually, so a few years ago when my daughter graduated from Barnard, we heard uh, uh, Cheryl Sandberg, and she spoke about the role of women in leadership and about the need to lean in, to get involved. And I would say to the patient, you lean in. You know, that's what you need, you, we need you to do. You have to be active. And you're, you know, the IPF community is amazing, right? Patients give their samples, participate. They're really special. They're so generous. But also, what they don't do is actually really lean in. And what I mean by really lean in is, if you've given a, your blood to a trial, you should request to know what happens. It is your data, nobody else's. And not only that it's your data, it's funded by your taxes. So it's double. And if it's a drug company, they're getting tax breaks to do the studies. So it's your money three times. <laughs> so request to get informed of the results. And, request, and also request to be tested for biomarkers. So you, you should actually, when somebody co comes and says, oh, I, we have the coolest molecule, you say, oh, but Dr. North said that I shouldn't have to go on a drug study without being genotyped. So I think the grassroots is going to drive the difference. So the request is from you. The other thing, and I'll go very quickly, and, and one thing is, as scientists, we need to move out of our comfort zone. We can go on and profile patients for years. But what we do is we have to enhance the resolution of lung profiling. We have to go beyond what we've been doing now. To learn and identify disease mechanism markers, we have to go to the lung, back to the lung. And we've shown in this meeting that uh, we can analyze differentially affected regions in the same lungs from normal to mild disease to moderate disease to end stage. And we can identify specific genes that are activated in end stage or in, early, in uh, uh, progression stage or in early disease. It doesn't matter. There's different families of genes. So we need to extend the study and then look at these genes. What is secreted? Can we find it in the blood? And also, what is inhibitable? Can we actually affect? Are there different needs to inhibit in early disease, established disease, and end stage? And maybe we can. And the last thing, so. What I, I would say is we always needed to understand IPF progression in our, uh, in our patients within the human lung. And the difference between now and 15 years ago when I started doing it is now we can do it. We have the technology. 
Similarly, we can now analyze every single cell in the IPF lung. So the IPF lung goes, every patient lung has like between 20 to 40 cell types. There's millions of cells. We can actually profile them. And this is really important, and we have shown uh, uh, in a poster, in an award-winning poster in this meeting, uh, uh, um, Tyler Adams showed the different new uh, insights that we get when we profile every single cell in the lungs of patients with uh, IPF, and I will not go into this. But what I will say is that we always, many of us focus on epithelial cells, or on fibroblasts, or on B cells, but what we need to do is to understand the contribution of every cell in the lung to the disease, not only the ones we love, because the truth is it's not the cells we love, it's the patients. So it is time for us to do what I call the Million IPF Cells Project, and basically profile IPF lungs in a way that will allow us to identify exactly what do we need to inhibit? What is telling me in terms of biomarkers when I find a molecule? Is that a crazy B cell, a crazy T cell, crazy macrophage, a crazy epithelial cell? And the reason I started with the B cell and this T cell is because there's so many drugs targeting them. You know, so if we understood what's going wrong inflammatorily in the, in the uh, IPF lung, we could have a whole transformative. So, towards the clinical utilization of biomarkers in IPF, and I'll mention the word precision medicine, we need to create a biomarkers consortium with all stakeholders, define baseline standard, baseline markers to be studied on every patient and shared with every patient if they want to, continue striving and integrate novel approaches, and aspect prospectively uh, uh, the response to current therapies, and again to the patients, request to see the results and actually request to have the test. So um, many people have been involved in this. Um, I will not mention all the names. I will give out, give out sh a shout out to Erica Herzog because I think she's giving the last talk in the meeting, which the way the combination, the disastrophe, the disastrous combination of Andy Limper, Imre Nof, and me is gonna make that your talk is gonna be like at 9 p.m. Uh, but I really wanna say, our, I, my talks are always dedicated to PF, Warriors, I love this hashtag. This is our patience. You know, we struggle, we, we fight against the disease. And of course, special thanks to po the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation and IH and NHLBI. Much of the work here, actually almost all of the work here was funded by uh, the NIH and some of it by the F Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation. And some actually of the most exciting results that I showed you were funded by the foundation. So we're really grateful because it, in the end, we know that there's not only the samples, but also the money came from all of you. So thank you all. <laughs>